We're here at the Retro Conference with Cliff Lane from NIAID, Clinical Director, and we wanted to cover with you something that you've been working at for years, IL-2. And if anybody knows that inside, outwards, and backwards, it is you. So tell us where we are today. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little backtrack and then into uh, where we are today with IL-2. Sure. I mean, IL-2 is a cytokine. It's produced by T cells of the immune system, and it causes the, the proliferation, the growth, the differentiation, the activation of a variety of elements of the immune system, including T cells. Mm -hmm. Um, it had been shown several years ago that giving uh, IL-2 intermittently in five-day cycles could cause an increase in the CD4 T cell count. And what wasn't known until the data presented today at the meeting was whether or not those increases in CD4 T cells uh, induced by IL-2 translate to any clinical benefit. And there are two studies presented today, the Esprit study presented by Marcelo Loso and the Silcat study uh, presented by Yves Levy showing that even though in either early stage patients or later stage patients, IL-2 can cause increases in the CD4 T cells that we thought would translate to clinical benefit. In fact, there was no clinical benefit shown. Mm -hmm. So this is a very clear result in two very large studies that, that really, I think, uh, bring to a close a question that's been out there for many years. Mm -hmm. and, and the question I would have, and maybe others, is that, that we have the marker uh, 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 CD4 and there are others, CD8, CD32, et cetera. Are there markers that we maybe don't know about that will give a better uh, understanding of immune based, uh, of the person's immune system? Uh, do you feel that there's some, a piece missing that we need to learn yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very important to point out that when you talk about T cells, all T cells are not the same. Mm -hmm. Now, I often use the analogy of you have to think of the T cell pool like you think of the uh, tiles in a game of Scrabble. Mm -hmm. They have antigenic specificities that don't change. Uh, in addition, they may have different effector functions. And if you look mm -hmm. at the precise nature of the T cells that are induced by IL-2, they're a very unique subset. Uh, they have some resemblance to a group of cells called T regulatory cells and whether or not by further studying the effects that we've seen with mm -hmm. IL-2 in patients with HIV, we may uncover some aspects of the functioning of the immune system that, if not helpful to patients with HIV infection, might in fact be helpful in other disease states. Mm -hmm. How do you see the field of immunology in and of itself moving? Is it, is it uh, becoming more robust or is it flattening out? Or Give us a sense of that. So uh, immunology is a, is a very interesting field to work in because it uh, involves uh, an array of different cells that can be characterized to a greater and greater degree, an array of different molecules that are constantly increasing in number. Um, what we don't have a very good understanding of is how, how this all works together and what some of the standards are, some of the benchmarks, what are the characteristics mm -hmm. of a healthy immune system, for example, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how can you make a less healthy immune system a more healthy immune system. There's a mm -hmm. lot of interest mm -hmm. in that. I think some of the complexities of the immune system may make that quite a challenge, but it certainly is an area mm -hmm. of very intense interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when you think of the immune system, you know, in the setting of HIV, we think of immunodeficiency or immune activation. Immune activation actually leads to inflammation. Inflammation leads to a whole array of chronic diseases. And one of the interesting things about um, HIV right now is seeing this intersection between HIV infection and a variety of chronic illnesses that haven't historically been associated with HIV infection, mm -hmm. but do mm -hmm. appear to be, such as cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. liver disease, mm -hmm. renal disease. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting time in getting a better appreciation of that intersection between the immune system, immune activation, inflammation, and chronic illness. Mm -hmm. and, and doesn't the immune system in each person's body, it's, they're all different, in, in one way or another, but don't they all, the, the immune system seems to compensate. You have the innate immune system, the, the, uh, a, the um, uh, adaptive immune system, and, and, and it, it sort of kicks in when it needs to, and, and that complicates treatment, I guess, from a perspective, because it may be compensating and overcompensating, or isn't, isn't this part of the mm. complexity because the immune system really does its own thing while you're trying to do something for it? Do you follow my train of thought uh, there? A little bit. Let yeah. me try to say it in a slightly different okay. way. All right. um, um, one can think of the immune system as having two elements, as, as you mentioned. The innate immune system, which is mm -hmm. there at all times that's at a steady the, state the of first, surveillance. That's the first 
that came along in evolution. Right, so that's the more yeah. primitive part. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't have the same degree of specificity of what's mm -hmm. referred to as the adaptive immune system, which, as its name suggests, adapts to the environment. So mm -hmm. your immune system and the characteristics of it are really determined by two things. Number one, your own genetics, because mm -hmm. the immune system has a genetic restriction to it. And number two, what antigens you've seen throughout your life. Mm -hmm. If you're exposed to an antigen, your adaptive immune system will expand in response to or that your antigen. Or your ancestors. Or your ancestors. Well, I mean, not so much your ancestors no? in terms of the adaptive immune system. You okay. need to see that antigen to then trigger those responses. I see. Okay. So how do, we, how do we see this field moving forward? Is it, what, are, what are the new things we're going to be looking at? Is genomics going to be a part of this that, that enter into it? And well, certainly the, um, the, the genetics of the immune system play an important role on how the host responds. And I think one of the mm -hmm. more interesting areas of uh, host genetics and HIV are these long-term non-progressors, individuals mm -hmm. who have viral loads of less than 50 copies despite mm -hmm. never having been on drugs. Well, the elite controllers as well, yeah. Right, so yeah, I, yeah. I think everyone will have a different name to describe right. oh, okay. the, the right. same yeah, set yeah, of okay. patients okay. perhaps, right. uh, but so if you talk about patients who control virus in the really absence well. of yeah. drugs, yeah. Uh, I think there's an accumulating body of data to suggest that that's mediated at least in part through the mm -hmm. CD8 mm -hmm. T cell pool, mm -hmm. and given the um, increased frequency of certain HLA alleles like HLA B57, which is mm -hmm. one of the molecules right. that presents antigens mm -hmm. to the T cell limb of the immune system, I think it's, it's quite likely that over time we'll understand better how the immune system can control HIV in some mm -hmm. individuals and potentially take that knowledge to control HIV better in other individuals who mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. perhaps have that same genetic mm -hmm. background. And then the other aspect is why do people progress? And, and the, right, and as, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's really a combination between the genetics of the host mm -hmm. and the conditions of the environment. So you have enormous mm -hmm. number of variables on both sides, um, mm -hmm. but with time and with you know, more modern metho methodologies that look, let you look at a large number of variables at once, it's hopeful mm -hmm. that we'll be able to understand those interactions better. So are we going to be seeing more markers? Are we going to be seeing, where, where, will, the, where will the advances, or where do the, let's say this, where do you see the advances need to come from? To learn more, is it? Is it? I would. I, I expect that since you're with the NIH in in an area that this is an area that would be important for us to really have a lot more discovery mm -hmm. to learn about the tools that we need. I think we're trying very hard to get a better understanding of the nature of the immune activation and the chronic inflammation seen in the setting of HIV. Mm -hmm. There was a, a study published um, within the last year showing that. Um, baseline levels of uh, a marker of coagulation, D-dimers, mm -hmm. had a very strong predictive value for poor outcomes, mm -hmm. suggesting that patients who otherwise may look fine have something going on systemically in terms of their vasculature and in terms of the perfusion of their organ systems that may give us clues uh, to some of the pathophysiology and ways to try to block that. I mean, maybe even um, you know, standard treatments for hypertension, standard treatments for atherosclerosis uh, mm -hmm. may play a much more important role in the setting of HIV and even at earlier stages in HIV mm -hmm. infection mm -hmm. than we might otherwise see. There's a, mm -hmm. a whole uh, acceleration of the aging process that you see mm -hmm. very clearly within the immune mm -hmm. system that may actually be going on within other mm -hmm. uh, organ systems as well. And this is something we saw early on. We, we kind of said that, I think if you reflect back on the early days, that, that AIDS looks like early aging. <laughs> And with antiretroviral yeah. therapy, that, that uh, was slowed down to a degree, yeah. but it may not be slowed down to Enough. the same degree yeah. as someone without HIV, even with good yeah. therapies yeah. that yeah. we have today. Yeah. So, um, anything else you, from any direction, you, you feel like you, you want to contribute here as far as what you see that you might take away from the conference? That, that would be useful, e either in clinical practice or advancement well, uh, in basic science. I, I think. Well, I think the to me one of the, the very important questions that we're still struggling with is when to start therapy. Mm -hmm. And there's been quite a bit of data and quite a bit of controversy about this area. And I mm -hmm. think more data, more detailed analysis of cohorts. Uh, I, I do believe that doing randomized controlled trials in this area is possible. And I think mm -hmm. it'll be very important bec because. The, the virus clearly has detrimental effects, the drugs clearly have some beneficial effects, mm -hmm. and the drugs also may have some detrimental effects. And I think this becomes a critical question mm -hmm. that will be very helpful in terms of improving care for patients with HIV infection. But the drugs seem to be more adapting towards comfort, comfort for the patient rather than the side effect issue is profoundly exactly. in effective in, the, I, in years gone by. Exactly. I mean, I think as the drugs get better and better, yeah. the, the, the negative aspect of the yeah. drugs will become less and less. And right now, the question is, where's the balance? Yeah. Right. Uh, where's the balance between right. early intervention and, and longer time on drug versus later yeah. intervention and shorter time on drug?